Famous imaginary planets abound in science fiction, from Gallifrey in Doctor Who to Vulcan from Star Trek to Tatooine in Star Wars. But while the planets themselves only exist in our minds, the same isn't always true about the stars they orbit. A surprising amount of famous sci-fi planets are actually stated to orbit stars that exist in real life. But what are the chances that these stars could host planets that people could actually live on? And what would it really be like to live on a planet that orbits those stars? My name is is Ellie Blackwood. I'm a fantasy writer in progress and a massive space nerd with a degree in astronomy. And today we're going to explore whether fictional planets could really exist around their real life host stars. <laughs> Vulcan is one of the most famous fictional planets. In Star Trek, it's the home of the Vulcans, most notably the iconic Mr. Spock. For years, the star that Vulcan orbits was never specified in the show, but a couple of real-life stars were suggested as candidates for Vulcan to orbit over the years, namely the stars Kyed and Epsilon Eridani. However, in 1991, the Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and three astrophysicists wrote a letter to the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine to clear it up. They said that Epsilon Eridani wouldn't work as Vulcan's host star because it's only about a billion years old, meaning that intelligent life wouldn't have had time to evolve on any planets orbiting that star. However, they said Kyed is about four billion years old, giving any planets orbiting it the time to evolve an intelligent civilization. So with that cleared up, is it really possible that Kyed could host a planet like Vulcan? Kyed is a bit smaller and cooler than our sun, and it's a member of the triple star system 40 Eridani, about 16 light years from Earth. On a dark night, Kyed is pretty easily visible with the naked eye in the constellation of Eridanus. The proper name Kyed is derived from the Arabic word for the eggshells, though the star is also sometimes known as 40 Eridani A. For several years, it has been known that Kyed's spin has some weird wobbles that some scientists thought might come from an orbiting planet's gravity tugging on the star. If the wobbles really were from a planet, then the planet would be over eight times the mass of Earth and orbit very close to the star. Unlike Vulcan, this would make it way too hot to support life as we know it. However, more recent studies have shown that the wobbles in Kyed's spin probably don't come from a planet. So as far as we know, Kyed's planets are confined solely to the realm of fiction, at least for now. Interestingly, Epsilon Eridani has been confirmed to have a planet since the letter rejecting it as Vulcan's host star was written, so maybe it gets the last laugh after all. If a planet did exist around Kyed though, its night sky would look pretty cool for its inhabitants. As Roddenberry and the astrophysicists letter pointed out, the other two stars in the 40 Eridani system would gleam brilliantly in the Vulcan sky, even brighter than Venus shines on Earth. <laughs> The star Canopus is the host of a few different fictional planets, including some mentioned in episodes of Star Trek and the planets in the Canopus in Argos novels by Doris Lessing. But perhaps the most famous Canopus planet is Arrakis, the home of the Freeman in Frank Herbert's 1965 novel Dune. Canopus is the second brightest star in the night sky, after Sirius, and can easily be seen with the naked eye in the constellation of Carina. The star is named after the Greek mythological character Canopus, who piloted the King of Sparta's ship during the Trojan war. Despite being over 310 light years away, Canopus is so bright because it's an extremely massive star over 10,000 times as luminous as our sun. Canopus has no known planets, but if it did, they might not be the nicest places to live. Canopus is only millions to tens of millions of years old, and it's already nearing the end of its life because it's burned through its fuel so quickly. That's not a lot of time for a habitable planet to form. It's unclear how long Canopus has left before it either puffs off its outer layer or explodes in a supernova. But even Canopus's remaining lifetime may not be enough for any rocky planets to become more than hot molten globes. Yes, Arrakis is a harsh desert planet that requires careful conservation of water for survival, but it's not quite as extreme as a literal ball of lava. Even though many of the inhabitants of Arrakis came there from other worlds once upon a time, including the Freeman, Arrakis is supposed to have had some life that evolved there, such as the sandworms. But given that the first bacterial life emerged on Earth about 600 million years after our solar system was formed and Canopus isn't nearly that old, it's highly unlikely that any planets orbiting Canopus would ever manage to evolve life. Additionally, Canopus gives off a lot more high-frequency radiation, such as X-rays and gamma rays, compared to our Sun. That means its planets would be more prone to having their atmospheres blasted right off. That's not to say no life could ever exist on planets orbiting Canopus, but it's much less likely than for a star like our Sun. Incidentally, there is also a real star 
nervous system that is sometimes called Arrakis, but that is derived from a name given to it by medieval Arab astronomers long before Dune was written. Krypton is famously the home planet of Superman, and it hosted a highly technologically advanced civilization that was wiped out upon the planet's destruction. In many comics, Krypton is stated to orbit a red sun, Rao, and the different qualities of light sometimes explain why Superman has powers on Earth, but not on Krypton. Rao was sometimes shown to be a massive red giant star, and in some of the Superman movies, Krypton gets destroyed by the red giant Rao going supernova. Other versions of the story show Rao as a red dwarf, which is a type of star much smaller and dimmer than our sun. In 2012, DC Comics wanted to write a story where Superman observes the destruction of Krypton from Earth, with the light from the explosion only having just reached Earth even though it happened a long time ago. So they got Neil deGrasse Tyson on board to pick a real star that Krypton could orbit. Tyson even appeared in Action Comics number 14 to mention this new piece of information. Tyson had a few parameters to work within. The star had to be 20-something light years away to allow Superman to observe the destruction of Krypton, which happened when he was a baby at the age of 20-something, and it had to be a red star to match the description of Rao. Out of the candidate stars that Tyson presented DC Comics with, they picked the one that happened to be in the constellation of Corvus. Corvus means crow, and Superman's high school mascot was a crow. This star was LHS 2520, a red dwarf star. More recent measurements have determined this star to be about 40 light years away, rather than the 27 light years that Tyson cited in 2012. Unfortunately, LHS 20 2520 isn't visible with the naked eye, so you won't be able to go Krypton spotting without a telescope. In reality, the star doesn't have any known planets, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have them. Red dwarf stars are often hosts for planets. Unlike the red giant version of Krypton's host star, or indeed stars like Canopus, red dwarfs can burn for over a trillion years without running out of fuel, so you might think they're an ideal place to make a home. But that's not always the case. Because red dwarfs are so small and cool, their habitable zone, where liquid water could exist on a planet's surface is very close to the actual star. This means any planets orbiting in the habitable zone are prone to getting tidally locked. Tidal locking is when a planet's spin is bound so that the same side of the planet is always facing the star. The moon is actually tidally locked to Earth, which is why we only ever see one side of the moon. If you were living on a planet that was tidally locked to its star, one side of the planet would have eternal daytime and the other side of the planet would have eternal night. This likely means that one side of the planet would get perpetually roasted and the other side would get perpetually frozen. Red dwarf stars are also prone to active solar flares that could occasionally blast any planets orbiting too close. A really large flare could blow a planet's atmosphere away and destroy any life that might have evolved there. All of this means that even though Krypton may seem like a pretty cool place in many versions of the Superman story, a real-life Krypton orbiting in the habitable zone of LHS 2520 may not be the sweetest of homes. Maybe that's what destroyed Krypton after all. Out of all the real-life stars that science fiction authors like to put planets around, Tau Ceti is one of the most popular. Authors such as Ursula K. Le Guin, Kim Stanley Robinson, Arthur C. Clarke, Samuel R. Delaney, Isaac Asimov, C.J. Cherry, Andy Weir, Frank Herbert, and Robert A. Heinlein have all written stories featuring planets around Tau Ceti. In Doctor Who, the fourth Doctor serial, The Stones of Blood, also featured aliens that came from Tau Ceti. So what makes Tau Ceti such a popular destination for science fiction authors? In a 20 2015 article, Barnes & Noble asked four authors why they decided to set stories around Tau Ceti. Ursula K. Le Guin's and Larry Niven's reasoning was that the star is pretty close to Earth and quite similar to our Sun, so they figured there's no reason why it couldn't have a planet like Earth. C.J. Cherry, on the other hand, had created a whole star map for planning her book Down Below Station by tracking stars in the night sky. She selected Tau Ceti because it's a pretty chill star without frequent solar flares, and it also worked out conveniently for the route that she planned for humanity to take across the stars. For his 2015 book Aurora, Kim Stanley Robinson mentioned that he'd heard that Tau Ceti has several confirmed large planets orbiting it, and he figured they might have some Earth-sized moons that might be nice to live on. So how justified were these authors' lines of reasoning? At only 12 light years away, Tau Ceti is easily visible with the naked eye in the constellation of Cetus. It's a little less massive and luminous than our Sun, but it is actually considered to have the same spectral type. It's 
actually the closest star to our solar system with a similar makeup to our sun that isn't also part of a multiple star system. Perhaps part of the allure for science fiction stories is that authors can easily create Earth-like planets around it without worrying about how having multiple stars in the system might affect their worlds. As Kim Stanley Robinson mentioned, there has been a lot of buzz about planets around Tau Ceti for a while. Various candidate planets have been investigated and contested, but NASA's Exoplanet Archive currently lists four confirmed planets around Tau Ceti. They're all sized between Earth and Neptune, and two of them might be in the habitable zone. In my opinion, the authors who've set stories around Tau Ceti actually have the right idea. Out of all the stars I've talked about in this video, Tau Ceti is the one most similar to our Sun, and therefore it's probably the one most likely to have a planet similar to Earth. But just because the Sun managed to produce life as we know it doesn't mean that other types of life couldn't exist around other stars. At the end of the day, who knows what's really out there? Be sure to leave a comment if any of this surprised you, and if you have any other favourite fictional planets that I didn't mention here. This is my first ever YouTube video, and I want to give you a huge thank you for coming along on this cosmic ride. Please give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my upcoming videos about science fiction and fantasy, space nerdery, Doctor Who, and all that goodness. Also be sure to subscribe to my monthly newsletter to make sure you don't miss any interesting content or any of the cool upcoming projects I'm working on. The link to that is in the description. See you next time. Mm -hmm.